Um, Welcome to the Space Telescope Public Lecture Series. Tonight's talk, Active Galaxies, Monsters of the Deep, Space. Travis Fisher from the Space Telescope Science Institute will be presenting. I am your host, Dr. Frank Summers of the Office of Public Outreach here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, I note that our public lecture series will continue to be online only throughout 2023. And of course, I always want to thank our amazing tech team, which is usually Thomas Marufu and Grant Justice. However, playing the part of Thomas Marufu tonight is Kevin Flynn. Thank you, Kevin, for filling in kind of last minute because it was only this afternoon that we had to change, change up our personnel. Our upcoming talks uh, in April, uh, Exploring Rocky Worlds on the Precipice of a New Frontier by Catherine Bennett, also of Space, Space Telescope Science Institute. In May, Amanda Pagul will be presenting a talk that doesn't have an exact title yet, but it will be on galaxy clusters and the frontier fields. So these are galaxies out at the edge of the universe. And on June, our June talk will be done in association with a science conference on the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. So they have asked us if we can delay it and actually put it on a Thursday. Yes, not a Tuesday night, a Thursday, uh, June 22nd. So note that special date uh, about the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, uh, but they haven't told me who their speaker is going to be. So uh, that will be a special event, uh, and uh, I, I will give you the details of that next month. Or you can find them on our website, www.stsci.edu slash public hyphen lectures, where you will find this web page. In the left, you can see the link to our webcast, both our YouTube playlist and our webcasting on the STSCI uh, webcasting page. And on the right, you can see how it, easy it is to sign up for our uh, monthly emails. Uh, just enter your email address, hit that subscribe button, and you'll get like two, maybe three emails per month. Also on our website are our list of upcoming lectures. And if you click on any one of those lectures, you will get the full details, including its description and links to the SDSEI webcast uh, after it's been recorded and also links to YouTube. Uh, our email, we send it out uh, just, as I said, a couple times a month. Uh, I showed you how to sign up the website. You can also, to get notifications, subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Hubble Space Telescope, all one word, Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, you'll get notices of new videos as well as reminders of live events like this. Finally, if you have comments or questions, you can send them to public lecture at STSCI. Edu. We handle social media here for the Hubble Space Telescope, for the Webb Space Telescope, and for the Space Telescope Science Institute. And you'll find them on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, Instagram at the uh, addresses listed. Um, I don't do much social media, so if you want to follow me, you're going to be kind of bored. Um, but you will find a few interesting things every now and then on Facebook and Twitter at Dr. Frank Summers. And now our news from the universe for March 2023. Our first story for you, the bespoke rings of Saturn. Well, Hubble has taken a lot of images of Saturn. Um, and in the late 1990s, we, that we got images of Saturn every single year. And you can see in the upper left, starting in December 1994, and then 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, and 2000. And you can see how the orientation of Saturn relative to Earth changes as Saturn moves around its orbit because it's not flat, that ring plane isn't flat to the ecliptic, it's actually tilted. So as Saturn moves around the solar system, um, the ring plane looked at different various tilts. And Saturn actually takes about 30 years to complete an orbit. So 
each season on Saturn lasts for about seven years. That'll be important in just a second. We continue to take pictures of images. Matter of fact, we have the Outer Planets uh, uh, legacy program called Opal. Um, and Opal got this beautiful image of Saturn in September of 2022. Yeah, just another gorgeous image. Saturn's just beautiful, okay? You know, we can't, uh, these, we're always really interested uh, in seeing Saturn, how Saturn looks. And with the Opal program in particular, they're studying the atmosphere and how it changes. However, this image is special not because of the atmosphere, which is still cool, okay, it's still cool, but it's also because in this image, ring spokes appeared. You see that, uh, those little blotches there in the, in, in, in the rings? Those are called ring spokes, okay? Um, and this is a new thing uh, recently, okay? We have seen them uh, originally starting with the Voyager 2, and Voyager 2 went by um, Saturn in August of 1981. Um, and again, you can see these smudges in the rings, uh, which is the first time we ever saw these ring spokes. They were also seen by the Cassini mission. Remember the Cassini mission that was at Saturn for like a decade? Uh, the Cassini mission saw them starting in September 2005. And here you can see, instead of being the dark smudges that Hubble and Voyager uh, saw in those previous two images, here you have some bright ring spokes um, in uh, Saturn's rings in September 2005. So why are the seasons on Saturn important? Because astronomers seem to have noticed that the ring spokes might have something to do with when Saturn is at equinox, okay? So uh, equinox is, the, separate, is the, the transfer from winter to spring. They have the spring equinox. And then it's also the transfer from summer uh, to fall, which is the fall equinox, right? So at the equinoxes, um, they find that this spoke activity is more prevalent or is only prevalent around the equinoxes. And so if you notice here in August 1995, you can see the rings edge on. That would be um, uh, around the equinox when Saturn's rings are flat on to, to the sun, okay? That would be the um, uh, transfer between northern uh, winter and, um, uh, and, and spring or between summer and fall. I'm not exactly sure. I guess this one is going into southern uh, summer. Uh, going in, in the sequence that we see here. Well, uh, what we know about Saturn now is the next equinox is coming up in two years, in May 2025. And so the astronomers are excited to see these spokes with Hubble uh, and, and have the clarity to be able to look at them um, and to study them over the course as we progress into the equinox and after the equinox to see how these spokes are because we don't actually know why the spokes appear. Uh, there is a dominant idea, a uh, hypothesis, that it has something to do with Saturn's magnetic fields. And so that, uh, that I'm not exactly sure why that would be activated at equinox, but that's what they tell me, that it has something to do with the, Saturn, the orientation of Saturn's magnetic field as we get to equinox. And so they're going to be looking at Saturn carefully over the next several years to see if they can test this hypothesis and what they can come up with as to what are the reasons that these spokes appear and that they seem to be seasonal in their appearance. Our second story is detailed galactic structure with fangs. Yes, going to sink our teeth into this story here. Let's start with a ground-based image, okay? This is a ground-based image of the Whirlpool Galaxy, also known as Messier 51. Honestly, it's my favorite galaxy, okay? It's just a gorgeous grand design spiral galaxy. But what's really cool is when you look at the view in visible light, and you contrast it to the view in infrared from the Spitzer Space Telescope. All right, so this is the visible light view. And this is the infrared view. And it's really kind of cool because you see all this glowing gas in the infrared, 
Well, if you go back to the visible light, that's all the dark gas. Those dark dust lanes that are opaque in visible light become emissive in infrared light. And you get to see all that internal structure of the gas within the spiral galaxy. The thing is, however, Spitzer isn't that high resolution, especially if I take that Spitzer image and then I compare it to the Hubble image. And it's like, whoa, whoa, there's just so much more resolution in the Hubble image, okay? Oh, I left K KPNO here. That's not Kitt Peak National Observatory. This is a Hubble image, okay? Oops, my bad. Um, but here's the Spitzer image and there's the Hubble image and the Hubble is such higher resolution. Wouldn't it be really cool if we had an infrared telescope with the same resolution as Hubble to see the same, those structures in this kind of detail? And of course, you know where I'm going with this because we have the James Webb Space Telescope up there now. But first, I need to tell you a little bit about the FANG survey, okay? So the FANG survey started out at the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, A-L-M-A, ALMA. All right, it started out as a survey at ALMA to look at nearby spiral galaxies. Um, that says physics at high angular resolution in nearby galaxies. Okay, so the NG is nearby, uh, NGS is actually nearby galaxies. Gotta get that S in there. Um, and ALMA is good as a radio sur survey of looking at the um, carbon monoxide molecule, which traces the cold star forming gas. Okay, uh, and they, looked at the gas disks in 90 nearby spiral galaxies to really start to underlook it. Then they said, let's contrast that with observations from other telescopes. So they did the FANGS MUSE program. All right, and MUSE is a instrument on the very large telescope at Sierra Tololo uh, in Chile. Um, and it's the multi-unit spectroscopic explorer. Um, it's what we call an integral field unit. Right? And an integral field unit is really cool because it gets images, but it also gets spectra at every pixel. All right, this is a really cool thing. We actually have an integral field unit on JWST. It won't be used for this, uh, what I'm talking about now, but it's being used for other things. Um, but the MUSE IFS on the VLT was able to do observations of many of these galaxies too. I think it says uh, here 19 star forming spiral galaxies with Muse uh, to contrast. And then they said, we want the really high resolution stuff. So where are you gonna go? You're gonna do FANGS HST, all right? And so uh, Hubble was able to look at 38 of these galaxies in optical light, okay? And then if you combine all three of those, you take the ALMA and the MUSE and the Hubble and put them together in an image, here's what NGC 3351 looks like. And so you've got three different wavelengths to look at and get all the various physics of star formation that's going on in these galaxies. But, and you know I was leading here, uh, what we really want uh, is the FANGS JWST. And last month, the, in the AppJ letters, uh, the first results from the FANGS JWST survey came out, okay? And they have a bunch of these galaxies. Um, they're actually doing 19 different galaxies with web. And so here I am tonight to show you just the very first results, just that's, a, that's sort of a teaser of what's going on. Um, and we released two images, uh, NGC 1433, and NGC 7496. And look at this, this is what I was telling you about. We're able to see that detailed structure of the gas and dust using these mid-infrared observations from the Webb Space Telescope and really see the detail in that fine resolution that I've been dreaming about for like a decade or two. All right, this is really great. So we're able to see the structure going on in here. And what's really cool in 7496 is that we're also seeing, you see that red light coming from the center? That's an active galactic nucleus here, all right? And you're gonna hear about a few things about active galaxies here. Uh, and it turns out that JWST's mid-infrared observations actually do see the emission from the material around active galactic nuclei here.
So this is just the beginning of what we're going to get from Fang's web. Um, and we're going to have to do all the correlations, the cross correlations against the visible light from Hubble, uh, the spectroscopic observations from Muse, and the radio observations from Alma. And being able to look in multiple wavelengths gives us more information to diagnose the physics that's going on in the star formation in these nearby spiral galaxies. So our speaker tonight is Travis Fisher, um, and he will be talking to us about active galaxies. Uh, Travis is here at the Space Telescope Science Institute as an ESA Aura astronomer, um, and he's been here since 2020. Although he tells me he has not spent much time in his office because he got here just before the pandemic started. Um, he uh, got his undergraduate degree at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I, it wasn't the University of Wisconsin the, the, the main campus. I forget the name of the, the, the subcampus uh, that, that he was at. And then he did his graduate work at Georgia State. Um, and then he uh, was able to move to the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area and work at three places, the U.S. Naval Observatory, uh, where he's a research, uh, researcher, um, at the Goddard Space Flight Center, where he was a JUST postdoctoral fellow. And then finally, he settled here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, so uh, it's been nice that his, uh, many astronomers actually move all around the globe uh, during that period after graduate school, but uh, he's been able to have a relatively, um, uh, relatively calm uh, moving uh, po possibility, which has allowed him to develop his family. He's got two kids. Uh, he says he likes hiking and the outdoors. Uh, so hopefully we won't lose him to Colorado, like where uh, several of our friends, uh, uh, many of uh, several of my, my friends who are astronomers love it because they get they really enjoy the hiking outdoors. But we got Travis here and we're keeping him. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Travis Fisher. Frank, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Um, so yeah, let's get to it and. Uh, so yeah, I'm here tonight to talk to everybody about uh, active galaxies. Uh, and this is just like a broad um, talk to kind of understand why we consider them the monsters of the universe, the monsters of the deep space, right? Uh, and so before we get there, we're gonna have to kind of slow it down and just start with the building blocks about like what is like a galaxy, first of all. So, I mean, we can't just jump right into AGN. So what is a, a galaxy by itself, first of all? And so um, a galaxy uh, is going to be just a cluster of star, uh, billions of stars, billions of stars, uh, and, and some, some gas and some dust that's all held together by gravity. So these are uh, Hubble images of a, of a bunch of nearby galaxies as part of this Legos survey. And we can see uh, it looks like static, but each one of these individual pixels, these little static points are actually resolved stars in these systems. And we can see that most of the space here is actually uh, empty but then each one of these little pixels that we're seeing little granulations from, those are individual stars that live in these, in these uh, little communities. So we ourselves live in a galaxy, the solar system lives in a spiral galaxy called the Milky Way. And it doesn't look like any other galaxy that we look at because we're living in it, right? So it looks much more um, spread out into a simple line. And so here is the image that we usually take from Earth, if you're looking up in the night sky, this is what you would see. And then below that is going to be a cartoon of what we think the Milky Way looks like today. And so you can kind of put yourself in perspective here if we, um, how it looks in the image and how it looks from the cartoon is we can just do like a 360 around the cartoon and get an idea that uh, and the entire line that you're seeing in this image of the Milky Way is 100 or 360 degrees around us. Um, and so galaxies uh, at the center of every galaxy or at almost every galaxy, but we're pretty sure they're in almost all of them, is a supermassive black hole. And so here is the image of the black hole, the supermassive black hole that lives in the center of our galaxy. We've named it Sagittarius A star because we like naming them interesting names. And so this is a, an image um, taken from the Event Horizon Telescope uh, not too long ago. And so this is what we um, are going to be focusing on, these supermassive black holes that live at the centers of galaxies. 
So a lot of every galaxy has one of these supermassive black holes, and so your question the question would be like, are what is a black hole itself? What are these objects that we have that are going to be the the basis of this talk today? And so to confirm, um, they are not a wormhole. They are not a portal. They're not a time rift. They're not some sort of um, gateway to another dimension. It's uh, often you see this sort of like tear in the space-time continuum and have people able to travel through them in science fiction. Or, uh, and so what we want to confirm right now is that these things, these black holes, are objects. All right? They're just like everything else that you would expect to see in the universe. They're just like planets or horses or gallons of milk. Um, these are objects in the universe that exist and uh, the only real difference between a black hole and everything else that exists in the universe is that black holes are extremely compact. Okay, So uh, let's try to come up with some sort of quantitative or maybe a qualitative uh, comparison of how compact black holes are. So here's a, a picture of a very massive star. This is an A-type star much more massive than our sun, about uh, eight times uh, the mass of uh, the sun that we live around in the solar system. And so when a uh, massive star like this ends its life cycle, it's going to explode and it's going to form a black hole. But the black hole that comes from the, this explosion is not going to be the size of that, uh, that star. It's going to be much, much smaller. In fact, if we try to measure what the event horizon is or the, the edge of the black hole that we define, it's going to be about 30 miles in diameter. And so uh, for reference, that's maybe the distance to drive across Rhode Island. Okay? So uh, black holes on the stellar mass side are incredibly small. Uh, for how much mass is packed inside one of these things. On the other hand, uh, we have the supermassive black hole that is at the center of most of these galaxies, and they are enormous. So this is a two-scale representation of Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius A star, again, is the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, and the amount of mass that's inside of this black hole is uh, more than 4 million times that of the Sun. So that's a huge number, and so it's very surprising then to me that the diameter of this black hole is only going to be about 18 of the size of the sun um, in diameter. So you could stack 18 suns end to end, and that would be the, the diameter of this supermassive black hole. So uh, this just gives you both of these, the stellar mass black hole and the supermassive black hole, um, they both are representative of very compact objects that exist in the universe. And to bring it back to the stellar mass black hole, um, just for comparison size, here is the size of Earth right there. I had a flashing pixel down, down there. That's the size of Earth in comparison to the Sun and in comparison to Sagittarius A star. So when we talk about stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes, uh, they are two completely far ends of the spectrum in the, uh, the size and scope of these objects. So uh, the question that I most get as a astronomer, as an astronomer that focuses on black holes in his career, is are black holes dangerous? Like, are they going to hurt us? Should we be concerned about black holes? And what I like to try to tell people is that, well, I mean, you could swim with sharks, but that'd be very dangerous. Instead, maybe the best idea would observe them from a safe distance inside of a cage and so that you're not even close to that shark. Um, in the same vein, uh, you could observe, you could look at a volcano while it's erupting, but if you're standing right next to a volcano while it's erupting, you're going to have a bad time. So instead, what you're going to want to do is find a safe distance to observe that volcano and get all the information that you want while not being burned up from the volcano. And then, so uh, if you see where I'm going with this, um, don't be near a black hole when you're trying to study it, all right? So black holes are dangerous objects if you go too close to them. What we can do, though, is safely sit on our planet Earth and look at all of these black holes that are in space 
and none of them are going to bother us. They are all at a very safe distance, and viewing them from a, a remote location means that they're not going to bother us at all. We're going to be okay. So that maybe people think that these black holes are dangerous because they think that they're vacuums uh, and they're going to pull everything in, but it's important to know that black holes don't suck, all right? So um, what we could do as kind of like a, a thought experiment here is to just take, this is a cartoon of our solar system. As you can see, there's the sun in the center and there's our eight planets that are surrounding it. If we remove the sun from our solar system and instead put in a black hole of equal mass, right? So nothing has changed other than the sun has come out and a black hole of equal mass has been in its place then all of the planets are going to continue orbiting around that black hole as if nothing happened. So they're going to be happily just orbiting around. Um, and since there's no change in mass at the center of the solar system, uh, nothing's going to uh, be affected in how their orbits uh, progress. Although it is true that we are removing all of the heat that's coming from the sun, so we're going to have our own set of problems because there's no sunlight, uh, that's a problem for a different day. So. Um, why do black holes then not, like people think that they, they suck because they don't uh, emit any photons. They're sucking in even light. Light can't escape. How does that work? And so when I try to explain that, I think about um, a rocket ship and how we try to take a rocket ship and leave uh, the surface of the Earth. All right. So here's a very um, basic equation uh, where we're just saying if we try to calculate the uh, velocity requires to escape the surface of something, we essentially just need to know the mass of the object we're trying to escape and also the distance from the center of that object. So to calculate the escape velocity uh, to leave Earth, we would just have the mass of Earth and we divide that by the, ra the radius of Earth. And if we do that calculation, we can see that uh, the velocity that's going to be required to leave Earth is about 11.2 kilometers per second. And I don't know how fast that is. If you asked me to try to figure out how fast 11.2 kilometers per second is, but we can just say that's how fast a rocket goes <laughs> because rockets have to be um, reaching this velocity to be able to escape the gravitational pull of Earth. And to be specific, uh, a rocket's not actually going that velocity is going a little bit slower than 11.2 kilometers per second because we're not trying to leave Earth's gravitational pull forever. So if we were trying to maybe send a, like a, a spaceship to another solar system, another stellar system, some exoplanets or something, then we would want to be going at least 11.2 kilometers per second. But we don't necessarily need to do that to send something up to like the moon, for instance. So um, that's what escape velocity is for Earth. Let's try to think about what would happen then if we turned Earth into an Earth mass black hole. All right, so the equation stays the same. The mass of Earth stays the same, but the distance that we're using from the center now is gonna be approximately the radius of a ping pong ball. That's how uh, large a black hole would be if it was the, uh, the mass of Earth. And so if we plug in that radius for our calculation, the required velocity to escape the black hole is a trillion kilometers per second. Again, another number that makes no sense to me, but you can kind of think of it in the way of comparing it to the speed of light because this is 3,000 times the speed of light. And so therefore, that's impossible. Like the fastest thing that we know of in the universe is the photon, is the light particle that is traveling the speed of light. Nothing can go faster than, than that. So if you have a rocket, on the surface of that black hole, it's not gonna leave because there's nothing that goes that fast. Even the, the rockets that the photons live in cannot travel fast enough to escape uh, the gravitational pull of the black hole. And that's why photons are not escaping from, from black holes. So black holes themselves aren't that scary. However, when you have stuff coming in on a collision course, um, you're going to have a bad time. So when there, here's a, an example of a star that's getting too close to a black hole and it's getting pulled apart, shredded, and you have all of this debris forming around the black holes. Parts of it are strewn around, but they're coming back. They're gonna be coming in to form a, a sort of a disk of debris that's surrounding this black hole. And so when we create these debris disks, uh, astronomers call this kind of disk an accretion disk. So accretion, 
is a word for like eating. Um, and so the black hole is eating this matter from the star or from a gas lane or whatever. And it starts spinning around the black hole. And as it's spinning around that black hole, as it's spiraling down the drain, it's heating up. So if you rub your hands together, your hands get warm. And so you can imagine that the dust and the gas and the debris that's spinning around this black hole is rubbing its hands together so fast that it doesn't produce just heat, but also UV rays, X-rays, gamma rays, a flood of radiation. And so when we have this situation go on around a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy, we form an event which is called an active galactic nucleus. And for short, we just call that an AGN. And AGN are uh, the monsters then, the, the giant dumpster fires that we're trying to understand that are wrecking the environments that they live in. So um, all of that UV and X-ray and gamma ray radiation is flooding out from around this accretion disk um, and they're extremely energetic. So what can we do? Like I tried to come up with a way to, again, quantify the num amount of energy that's coming out from an average um, or even like a low end supermassive black hole. So I, I did a calculation for like one of my, near my favorite nearby lower luminosity um, supermassive black holes, the active galaxies. And I figured, okay, you have an, uh, an atomic bomb. That makes sense. So let's have, how many atomic bombs do we need? And so it turns out that if you took an atomic bomb for every grain of sand on earth, and you detonated it at the same time, that's not enough. You're not gonna create even close to what you need from, uh, to create the energy coming from an AGN. Instead, what you need to do is create 160,000 Earths <laughs> and duplicate them to get all of the sand from those Earths and then turn all of that sand into atomic bombs and if you detonate all of that at the same time, then you're creating the energy that's coming from a AGN uh, per second. So the amount of energy that's coming out of these things is enormous. It's just crazy big. And so the question then is if there's all of this energy that's coming from this very small object and the accretion disk surrounding it, like uh, what does that energy do? And so, um, to come up with a kind of a comparison of uh, like with some thing that is not necessarily astronomy related, I was watching the show uh, Chernobyl. And so this is a show on HBO, uh, spoiler alert, Chernobyl explodes. And so there, there's a scene where there's a lot of folks watching from a great distance uh, and they're looking at the explosion and they can see that there's this bright blue beam of light that's shooting up from the, um, where the disaster is happening and they're saying, wow, it's so beautiful. And so what's happening in this situation is that the radiation that's coming from the uh, reactor meltdown is flooding up into the atmosphere and it's frying the air molecules that are, it's stripping electrons off of the air, the atoms that are up there and it's called ionization. And so uh, I'm pretty sure it's blue then because the most gas that is in our atmosphere is nitrogen. And so the blue color is coming from the majority of the gas being nitrogen, and that's the color that is most going to be that's going to be most dominant in the ionized gas uh, of our atmosphere. So you can see then, or have an idea that the only way you can create this this glowing gas is if you expose that gas to an enormous source of radiation. So we see then a similar process um, happening in all of the AGN that we look at. So here's a, a nearby active galaxy, uh, and we can zoom in to where the, the nucleus is. Uh, and so we can take a, and so um, here is then a picture using the uh, Muse cube, Muse field. So this is what Frank was talking about earlier. This cutout is the Muse field uh, for this specific galaxy. And then we can look at the individual uh, colors of the ionized gas, the fried gas in here, to kind of see the impact that the AGN is having on its host galaxy. So when we turn that filter on, we can see that there is this really beautiful biconical or hourglass shape that's happening here. And this is the, due to the same process where you're having radiation coming from that central black hole flooding out into the system 
and uh, frying that gas. So here's kind of a cartoon that I helped put together at Goddard um, where, yeah, so the, the AGN is shining out into the host disk and it's kind of acting like a flashlight of doom where all of the radiation that's coming out from the, the central engine is frying anything in its path that it runs into. And so that's what you're producing, then you're kind of producing uh, this, this flashlight effect of where all the gas that's being impacted by the radiation from the central engine. So we can also kind of uh, figure out the impact uh, of that radiation if we look at the what we call the kinematics of that gas uh, using this MUSE uh, IFU data cube where we're having imaging but also spectra. So to just um, talk about uh, how we analyze that data, we're just going to step into talking about the Doppler effect real quick. So the Doppler effect is where you have a shift of a frequency due to some sort of velocity occurring. So we have an ambulance in this example. The ambulance is making a noise. The ambulance is not moving anywhere. So the sound that is heard by the people in front and behind the ambulance is going to be the same frequency. Alternatively, if you have that ambulance traveling at a specific velocity, the wavelengths in front of the ambulance are going to be squished together and create a higher frequency whereas the, wa the wavelengths um, behind the ambulance are going to be stretched apart, creating a lower frequency. So the, the best way to do it is just thinking about like a race car coming towards you, right? So it's a higher pitched sound coming towards you, lower pitched sound going away. And so we can apply that same uh, effect with light. So if we have a light bulb and the light bulb is giving off photons, if that, that light bulb isn't moving anywhere, the photons that we're seeing on either end are going to be the same wavelength. I'm saying green for this example. But if we have that light bulb uh, having a specific velocity, uh, the wavelengths then get squished together or spread out. And so if it's squished together, we see a bluer wavelength. And if it's stretched out, we see a redder wavelength. And so these are called uh, blue shifts, when the light becomes bluer, it's shifted toward the blue end of the spectrum. And when it's traveling and being spread out, we call that the red shift, or it's being shifted into the redder end of the spectrum. Okay, so we can use that idea of blue shifts and red shifts um, to equip ourselves to understand the data that we're going to look at right now then. So we go back to our Muse cube um, of this active galaxy, and we can look at the velocity of the gas and we see that most of the gas here is orbiting the center of the galaxy. So what overall this is, is a big rotating um, bike wheel, if you will, um, so that the bottom right hand field is rotating towards us, and then the upper left hand corner is, excuse me, rotating away from us. So the, the foreground of the galaxy is to the bottom left, and then the background of the galaxy is to the upper right. So this is most of the gas that's happening in the galaxy. This is gas that is maybe attributed to stars that are uh, in the host plane that are rotating around. But then we can also isolate just what the ionized gas is doing, the gas that is being fried by the active galaxy, and we can see what's happening with those kinematics as well. And so uh, we see then here, the AGN is driving the ionized gas out of the galaxy. So instead of our rotation curve here, now what we have is a radial motion, which means it's going from the center, traveling out like along a radius or a spoke and in a wheel. And so you can see that the gas, the fried gas in the upper right hand corner is being driven toward us. Uh, and then the gas in the bottom left is being is red shifted and being driven away from us. So what you kind of have happening here is the flashlight is running into that plane of the galaxy and then the gas is running into that and then kind of hitting a dense patch and maybe popping up uh, and splashing upwards. So you guys can maybe think about like that movie with the Little Mermaid and she's on the rock and she's singing and the wave comes crashing up behind her um, because the wave has hit that hard dense uh, medium and is splashing up uh, to create that um, that displacement out of the plane. And so that's what we're kind of seeing then with this gas being driven out of the plane of the galaxy. And so um, 
Besides also noticing what the redshift and blue shift of the galaxy, uh, the gas is, we can actually measure the velocity of this gas. And so when we look at how, much, how red shifted or blue shifted that gas is, we can measure that the gas is traveling roughly 300 kilometers per second. Uh, and typically it can be greater than that. And so what that really converts to another giant number, it's 670 miles an hour, but um, more for my human brain, it's like you're traveling from Seattle to Miami uh, along roads, hoping there's no traffic, and you're gonna arrive there in a, a little under 18 seconds. So you can kind of imagine then that this gas is not very pleasant. It's ionized, it's, it's frying the heck out of whatever it's the touching the radiation is, and then it's also sweeping everything up and driving it out uh, at bullet train speeds, faster than bullet train, right? It's 18 seconds, it's crazy. So the reason that I say that they're these monsters then is that you see these beautiful pictures that we're always looking at in this ionized gas. And it's very similar to me as looking at hurricanes from space. And you're looking at them and you're saying, wow, nature is glorious, nature is beautiful. But then if you're living in that hurricane, it is the worst. So the same thing would be happening if we're living in an active galaxy. There's tons of radiation that would be pelting our atmosphere and lots of winds that are traveling and blowing everything away, blowing our atmosphere probably away. So we'd be having just the worst time if we're living in this beautiful light echo that we're seeing in these galaxies. So this is why uh, we consider them the monsters of the universe that they are. So the question then is these things, well, we've confirmed, I, I believe that these are monsters. Um, and so how do these AGN affect their galaxies? And we're still trying to figure that out, right? So, I mean, we have a general understanding of what's going on here, but we're not really sure how it's impacting the host galaxy. What kind of effects does this have? And so um, to try to understand how it's affecting a galaxy, we need to know how stars form in a galaxy. So here's a picture of the Orion Nebula, and we're doing a fly-through of a video that was created um, to kind of simulate what the Orion Nebula looks like. And as we're traveling through, we can see that all of this gas has um, formed on itself and compressed down. And when you have enough gas, it's going to ignite through fusion into stars. And you form all of these stars, which eventually blow away their cocoon of, of gas to reveal themselves. But the point here is that you need all of this gas to form stars in a galaxy. So uh, AGN then kind of affects how stars form, all right? Because the winds are interacting with that star forming material. So the way that I connect what's happening in a galaxy to my brain is then by trying to compare it to maybe what the, um, the, the physics that you see in a sink at home when you turn the faucet on, right? So you turn the faucet on, sometimes you have this water that's hitting the bottom of the sink and uh, it pushes it outward until you get to this like ring, this barrier, where it, it, this pressure ridge or whatever. And so uh, both of these, um, both AGN and this faucet situation have the two forms of feedback that I think are, are important for us to try to understand how galaxies evolve over time. The first one, being that AGN can remove gas at small radii to prevent star formation. So you have these winds that are traveling, the radiation is running into the gas and it's pushing it outward uh, and removing any sort of uh, gas that exists at these small radii. And that means you're preventing um, future stars from forming because you're removing the nurseries. You're, you're not allowing any gas to exist there from star, which stars can form from. And so what we call this is a, we call it a negative uh, feedback scenario. Where we're removing the potential for star formation. Um, also, at greater distances, uh, the wind, the driving effect is not gonna be as powerful in these uh, galaxies. And what we are then seeing potentially is that the gas is being pushed together. And so that is being compressed um, at greater, radii, greater radii, and then when you're compressing the gas, you're kind of giving 
the stellar nurseries like a head start or pressing like fast forward, right? Because you're pushing the gas together and making it easier for those stars to form um, at later epochs. So when you're then promoting star formation, this is called a positive uh, feedback situation. So um, we're trying to understand both the positive and the negative feedback situations, and we're I'm um, going to be using James Webb. James Webb is fantastic for revealing the new dimensions, or several new dimensions, of AGN astronomy. Um, and so we can just talk about real quickly what those dimensions are, but Frank did a very nice job of uh, summarizing some of them earlier as well, so I might be repeating uh, him a little bit here. But uh, the first one is that um, we're seeing a new dimension of space, all right? So um, nearby galaxies, if they're emitting light in the optical, we, Hubble got you. Hubble can see that emission um, from these nearby active galaxies in the optical, and we've learned so, so much about how uh, active galaxies, regular galaxies, um, anything in the nearby universe happens to operate in the optical, but as you go to greater distances away from Earth, the universe is always expanding, and again, that uh, Doppler shift comes into play, whereas everything is expanding away from us, that light that once was in the optical is now shifted to the infrared. So we can't observe these more distant galaxies in the same way with Hubble as we're looking at the galaxies in the nearby universe. We can't do a one-to-one -one comparison. So if we include uh, observations from the James Webb Space Telescope, we're now able to be more sensitive to the infrared light that has been redshifted and is representative of the optical light that is coming from the more nearby galaxies. And now we're able to have that one-to-one -one comparison to see how do how does the universe change from these greater distances to the more nearby universe? Well, this one has more emission of this hydrogen line that we see um, than at the galaxies that are nearer, nearer to us, right? So we're able to make this comparison um, between the optical nearby universe and the infrared uh, universe at greater distances. Um, additionally, another dimension that um, James Webb provides us is just wavelength space. So this is uh, also from that FANGS project um, showing this NGC 7469. And what we're doing is we're blinking between the optical and the Hubble imaging. And then the glowing red um, here is the dust that's glowing in the infrared. So it's providing, as Frank had mentioned earlier, this additional dimension to these galaxies. So we understand it in the optical light, what's happening with this ionized gas, what's happening with the light um, being from, coming from the fried gas, but we have very little information about the cold uh, molecular gas that's in these galaxies. So with the infrared light coming from uh, James Webb observations, we're able to have more puzzle pieces to put together to tell that story to be what you guess, I guess you could be like a gumshoe or a detective where you're gathering all these different clues for the same target using different wavelengths, different wave bands to come up with a, a coher cohesive story of what's happening in each of these nearby galaxies. And then um, the other dimension that Hubble is bringing us, again, uh, as Frank had mentioned, is resolution. So this is pre there was a previous Spitzer image here, and then we were able to transition to what James Webb brings uh, uh, us now. So James Webb has a much larger mirror, and so we're going to be able to pick up much finer resolution imaging. And additionally, since it is a larger mirror, we're also collecting more photons per observation uh, hour. So we're gonna be able to collect more photons and then have a sharper image of where those photons are coming from, thanks to the James Webb observations. So, you think about that. Um, what does that mean for me? Like, what do I do? with James Webb, with AGN, like how are, am I involved in all of this? Well, so what I'm trying to understand then is how the ionized gas that we're looking at in all of these previous observations um, right now, I'm really interested in how they're aligned with radio emission. So radio is still light. It's at the far end of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we're seeing that the radio structure, which is the blue contour maps uh, in this slide, is related to the fried ionized gas that I was talking about earlier, which is the green in this slide. And so often in AGN, we see them aligned, but 
there are also these really beautiful um, radio loud galaxies that have these magnificent jets. So you can see that the galaxy is kind of perpendicular to this very beam like structure here. And so folks are seeing these radio jets and then they see the radio structures in these other AGN, these other AG, um, these less magnificent ones, and they say, are these processes related? Um, and so what I am not so sure of is whether they are related. I think that they might be due to different processes. So when we're looking at um, active galaxies that aren't, that don't have those magnificent plumes of radio, we often see that the radio structure is aligned with the ionized gas. And here's a train of many different papers that compare uh, the maps are often the ionized gas and the contours are the radio data. And we always see the radio data that is intertwined with the ionized gas here. And so what's that suggesting to me is that the radio structure is always in the plane of the host galaxy because that's where the ionized gas is coming from. It's being its uh, molecular gas lanes that are being lit up by that flashlight of doom and so if the radio structure is along where that flashlight of doom structure is, that means that the radio always has to be in the plane of the galaxy, which would be weird if it was just a, a jet, a plume that could be at any individual inclination. So what I'm testing right now is that the radio structure that we're seeing might actually be due to the winds that are launched from that active galaxy in the center slamming into dense medium that it can no longer drive out uh, away from the center of the galaxy. And when you have these high velocity winds that we talked about earlier, traveling hundreds to thousands of kilometers per second, they slam into this dense molecular gas that it can't drive anymore. And it creates this shock that's very similar to what you'd see in like a supernova remnant. And so what you're seeing then are just gal galaxy scale supernova remnants that are producing this radio structure that looks like those plumes that we see in some of these other AGN. So that kind of brings us back to the beginning then. Um, so I had this uh, picture of a galaxy at the beginning of the talk. And what's going on uh, with that is that we are planning to observe this target uh, with James Webb uh, later this month. I'm super excited. Um, so this is a very nearby galaxy that has these radio plumes going on here. And I want to test whether the radio structure, these blue, this blue S-shaped structure that you're seeing here, lies along where that glowing dust is in the imaging that we taught, we showed earlier. So we're going to compare the blue structure here with the emission that we're seeing from the James Webb infrared cameras to show that, again, the radio structure is in the plane of the host disk because what's probably happening is that the winds are launching outward, shocking the material in the host galaxy, and producing this what looks like a plume or a jet, um, but it's actually just a giant uh, galaxy size um, supernova-esque remnant. So um, to wrap up, uh, AGN are dangerous. Are we in danger? Uh, and I would just like to dissuade you from being nervous because uh, we've seen that we uh, the Milky Way had an active period about 2.6 million years ago and that uh, the evidence of this active period is highlighted by these high energy bubbles that are uh, driven perpendicular from the host galaxy um, that is that line that we looked at earlier. So here's kind of an a, a animation of what's happening here, right? So here again, the, the radiation field that's coming from the active galactic nucleus in the center is pointed out of the plane of the galaxy, and we're probably not going to have to deal with any of the massive amounts of radiation that would be pouring out of it as it's, it's pointed out of the plane. So we're probably relatively safe. So uh, with that, I thank you so much for your time, and I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Thanks again. All right. Thank you very much, Travis. That was a, I don't know, probably the most active talk that we've ever seen. I guess the unactive galaxy is going to use, but you use more transitions and animations and such than anybody else has used. So big applause for that. Uh, that was very, extremely well prepared. So I get to ask the first question. Um, and my first question for you is, um, let's, let's get into this 
active galaxies as to how long they remain active. Okay, and and so like it's just sort of two questions in one. Is that that um, you know you say that the Milky Way is not active now, but it used to be active. Okay, so at any one time, what percentage of galaxies are active? Um, and I, that's sort of related to how long does a galaxy remain active once it becomes active? Uh, what, 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 sure. what, what percentage of its lifetime is it an active galaxy? Right. So galaxies are active, and it's not because they don't just turn on necessarily. There has to be a reason that the material is funneling into that supermassive black hole, like that star that was traveling toward the black hole. It wasn't just on a happy path. It was probably flung there from a binary system or some reason to be flung out of its orbit toward that black hole. So um, galaxies often under, undergo mergers or there's maybe some sort of uh, stream of gas that's coming from a neighboring galaxy that falls in to activate the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And so we see that um, often it's a, only a few percent of all of the millions of galaxies that we know of are active at any given time. And um, we're not really sure how long an active period in an AGN lasts. I, I don't know if I've ever seen one ever turn on or turn off necessarily, but they should <laughs> last, uh, at, we, we think that they last like a couple hundred thousand years at a time. Um, so, but yes, I've never seen one turn on or off, I don't think. <laughs> So, so nobody just sort of flips a switch and, and says, "Okay, you're now active." Right. And then, all right, that's hey, right. Hey, I need I need some I need some quiet over here. Stop being active. Yeah, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> Wish you could do that with your kids sometimes, right? Uh, so, uh, Grant Justice has been monitoring the chat. We've had an ex a, a, a excellent chat here. I uh, think Grant uh, is going to join us and pull some questions from that chat for you. What have you got for Absolutely. us tonight, Grant? Um, first, before I begin the questions, I have to say Flashlight of Doom is the best descriptor I've ever heard in a public lecture series. <laughs> That's right. So it's not a good a, time. A plus. A yeah. plus. <laughs> All right. Um, so first question starting off. Um, do supermassive black holes behave differently from, quote, unquote, regular black holes because they were formed through a different process? Well, uh, we don't know how supermassive black holes form. So um, that would be uh, a good question or a good answer to figure out, first of all. But um, no, uh, any black hole essentially has a mass, a mass and uh, a spin, how much it's spinning. And I think that no matter the mass of that black hole, those are the two parameters that we really only, we know about the black hole. So, I mean, there's been a lot of work to try to understand. So you see like the stellar mass black holes are often eating material from uh, a binary star system. So it's a black hole uh, and a star companion. And so it's eating the material off of that stellar companion and creating an accretion disk and there's material flying off of it. And we try, we want to be able to relate that to what we see in AGN, but it just hasn't clicked so far. So it's just the environment is just a little different um, between the two um, that we can't really compare the science that's going on between them. But they, okay. they are relatively the same object. Right. And uh, if yeah. I remember my graduate school work, there were three parameters a black hole could have, a mass, spin, and charge, but they're so, they're so large that they generally would never ever get an, a positive or electric or negative electric yeah. charge. It would all balance out. Large. That's what I remember. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so at the beginning, you mentioned that black holes are very much not as you would expect from the Hollywood depiction, per se. Um, but what does happen to time near or oh in, per se, a black hole? <laughs> I mean, you knew it was coming. You knew Come it. on, yeah. Travis, you know that questions like this are going to be are out there. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't. I don't know. I, like, I, I, That's so, a fair but, answer, though. We're all yeah. So, learn. like, but I, I mean, it's just because of my inexperience with it. Because I deal, ideally, like, I go to these conferences uh, looking at active galactic nuclei, and there's uh, a whole spectrum of people that start from the very center where there's the black hole and the accretion disk, and then there's like the, the around that is a big dusty torus, and then. There, but, 
past that is like maybe like the high energy people. And then I'm way out here that's looking at like the winds interacting with the host galaxy and what that's doing. And so even though we're all the same like astronomers, I don't know what's going on. Like I don't have the answers for what's going on down there because I just, I'm not ever talking about it enough. So I, I don't have the, the brilliant answer for that. Sure, it's a highly specialized field of study. There are many different facets, so. All right. Yeah, um, I'm going to go home and cry that I'm not the astronomer <laughs> I should be. There are, no, there, there, there are folks who specialize in trying to tell yes. the public what a black hole is like, you know. Uh, the yeah. one thing I remember from uh, all these discussions of supermassive black holes is that the, um, the Schwarzschild radius is so large, it's solar system size, such that your spaceship passing through the Schwar it's pa passing in, in through the event horizon wouldn't really be as, you know, stretched out as it would be, you know, um, working with a stellar mass black hole. The, uh, the, the, the field is, 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 is much, much more spread. I don't know. It's, it's still intense, but it's, it's the, 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 the tidal forces aren't as strong, right? Yeah. Um, that's all I remember. Gotcha. I would say um, to the user who asked, I think your name was you too. Um, just go ahead and check some of our other public lectures. We've had quite a few on this. and I'm From the more knowledgeable astronomers, more. go find them. And <laughs> no, someone who specializes in that particular section of black hole study. <laughs> Don't apologize for having a specialty. It's a good thing. <laughs> All right. Um, have we observed any AGNs that are ending an active period and becoming inactive? Uh, we, so we yeah, we sort of covered co co that. Oh, we kind of uh, covered well, that no, a little that, bit more in the beginning. That's So, yes, we've never seen one turn off. But we do see like these light echoes, right? So the radiation Ooh. is traveling at the speed of light. It can't go any faster than that. So you can see uh, some galaxies have these radiation, these ionization. The flashlight is still on at great distances, but the AGN has turned off since then. And so at smaller distances, the flashlight is off, right? So you see, we call them vorwerps. Um, so the radiation has run out, it's running through the host galaxy or whatever it's running into, but the AGN is now off. So there's like, it's just this cloud of ionized gas by itself. That's um, because the AGN has turned off. Okay, so that bring that begs the question is, how do we know that the, I mean, we, we see the, the, the bubbles in the Milky Way. How do we know it was 2.6 million years ago? Um, for the, the, yeah, that those I bubbles think were created. I, I'm not sure. I, I was touching <laughs> base with some folks about that, um, but I think it might just be the energetics and the required velocity that things are traveling um, to create to puff up that bubble at the velocities that they're traveling now. You would, requ it would require you to walk back 2.6 million years ago to, to see that. That one. <laughs> okay, um, so. You had mentioned radio structures uh, at the very end of your talk. Uh, what frequencies do you observe those at? And what about radio emissions from galactic jets such as NGC 2663? I'd have to go on Google, 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 Google 2663. 2663. <laughs> yeah, what is that one specifically? <laughs> on but I mean, this relates to things like um, Hercules A, or you, you mentioned Centaurus. It's an elliptical A. galaxy. Okay, got it. So um, an, an elliptical galaxy, uh, there are these structures, and I showed them in that image of Centaurus A. You have these radio jets, and the radio jets come from our prominent in what are called radio loud AGN. So while AGN only are a few percentage of all of the galaxies in the universe, radio loud AGN are only a few percentage of all of the AGN in the universe. And so you have these environments where you're producing these very long plumes, these jets, these radio jets of relativistic plasma. This stuff is traveling uh, of almost the speed of light and you can measure like the it um, traveling at these relativistic speeds when we observe them over time. And so the point of, that I was trying to make then is that 
uh, in a lot of these radio quiet AGN, which is the majority of AGN that we study, we also see radio structures. And so uh, folks see these elongated radio structures and they say, boom, that is also a jet because I know what a jet looks like and it looks like that. So, um, I'm, but what I'm trying to uh, show or confirm or find evidence to deny, I mean, test, we're just testing it out, is to find out if that radio structure is not a jet, it's actually a shock process similar to what you're seeing in the supernova remnants, okay? So you have the winds that are running out from the center of the galaxy, they're running into host disk material, shocking it and producing that radio structure as kind of like a splash along the edge of that dense molecular gas lane. So the, a general hypothesis or test would be if these aren't due to winds running into material, there should be these jets in these radio quiet AGN that are traveling at, dis or at angles that are not aligned with the host disk. But every single galaxy that I've looked at, that, um, that we've, I showed in that uh, train of images, always shows that the radio structure is aligned with the ionized fried gas, which means that it's always in the plane of the galaxy. So um, NGC 2663 is an elliptical galaxy. I'm presuming it's radio loud and it doesn't have any sort of gas to be running into and it probably has a pencil beam radio jet. And that is not the same then as what we're seeing in a majority of these AGN. And so right. why is that important? Because then we can start measuring the amount, the, the distance at which positive feedback where you're compressing that gas, the maximum amount of, uh, the maximum radius at which positive feedback uh, exists. And so this is just helping us understand the overall picture of radio, uh, AGN feedback then by knowing that it's not a jet, invoking a jet, but it actually is a byproduct of the winds interacting with the host galaxy. Right, and, and we should make sure that our audience understands that elliptical galaxies generally have very little gas and dust, right, in them, so that it can't run into stuff, all right, that doesn't have it, uh, so versus the spiral galaxies, which would be more what you're studying. That's right. So yes, most of these radio loud galaxies are the elliptical galaxies, which are red and dead. There's not a lot of gas. That, what's behind me here is a spiral galaxy. So you got lots of blue stars happening here, a lot of young star formation, a lot of gas to form stars. Ellipticals have, uh, have little to no gas in them. And so all the stars are just the smoldering embers of the low mass stars that still exist there. All right. Uh, Grant, what else have we got from the chat here tonight? Um, I keep seeing I've seen new a messages variation. up here. <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, I've seen a couple of variations of the same question, which is what causes the jets to shoot in their particular directions rather than just anywhere and everywhere? Right. Yeah, so w what we think is happening when you are creating a radio jet is that so we have seen the accretion disk. Let's actually kind of go back. Can I play my slides a little bit again? Yeah, Absolutely. No, no problem. Uh, uh, start your screen share again. Yeah. Um, so here's this animation that's showing the material is being stripped from this star and is forming the accretion disk around uh, the, super, the black hole in this animation. And so um, our models predict that in what you can see here, perpendicular to that accretion disk is the radio jet in this cartoon. So the jet uh, that is being emitted by this black hole in this system is gonna be perpendicular to that accretion disk. So if we say that the radio jet is related to the uh, orientation of the black hole and the accretion disk, if that means it should, and it's, there is no relationship between the orientation of the supermassive black hole and its accretion disk with the, the greater uh, galaxy, all right? So if the galaxy yep. is in the plane of this plane, <laughs> and the uh, accretion disk doesn't also have to be in that plane. It can be pointed like this, and then the winds are traveling in this direction. Um, so it can be at any random orientation versus that of the host that it lives in. However, what we're finding then is that the radio, that radio jet, is always perpendicular, or I mean, I guess it's always running into that plane of the host disk material. So if it was just a jet, it should be at some random orientation shooting out at all, any sort of direction. 
but it's always pointed so that the um, radio structure is along that plane of that host galaxy, of the material that we're looking at in that galaxy. So you, you're okay. saying that the radio emission basically comes from the interaction of the where, where the jet hits the material that's in the disk. Of, of the galaxy. So I'm so saying you get that, that uh, orientation. Yeah. So if it was a jet, it would be a relativistic plasma that's traveling perpendicular to that accretion disk, going off somewhere. But what we're seeing then is that the radiation from the AGN is probably running outward into that host plane material and smacking into it, compressing it, shocking it. And then the radio structure is formed right there. So you're, you're, um, you create a bunch of cosmic rays or a bunch of free particles from the shock happening. And then the shock travels along uh, magnetic field lines in the gas, the, the, the cool gas that's there. And that produces what's called uh, synchrotron radiation. So that's a radio emission. That is when um, particles travel along magnetic field lines and emit this radio structure. So that's the radio that you're seeing then. And since you're forming that splash along maybe like a spiral arm or some sort of dust lane, that splash looks like it's called collimated. It's, it looks like it's collimated like the beam of a jet. So that's why people say, oh, that looks like the jet that I'm used to looking at. Um, but what it is, it's a red herring in that sense, is that it's, it's yeah. not actually being collimated. So, I mean, okay. that, that's an interesting point of view, is that the uh, interesting point to make that the radio emission happens where the energy is gets deposited into the material that it runs into. I mean, that's right. Um, I remember the same sort of thing is, is true for some radio loud stuff in terms of you getting the synchrotron radiation wherever it slows down, uh, which is, on, in those cases, well outside the, the, the visible extent of the galaxy, which is... Right, yeah, really so you cool. can't trace, like... A molecular gas lane of the host galaxy alongside those radio jets. Those radio jets are doing their own thing, and you can't trace parts of the galaxy to be intertwined with the radio structure in those cases. But in these radio quiet AGN, you often see that the radio uh, emission is, I keep saying, intertwined with the ionized gas, which means it's always lodged into the host plane, the host material of that galaxy. Cool. All right. Uh, any more questions we've got there, Grant? Yes. Um, AC is keeping me honest. The first part <laughs> of our previous question, uh, what frequencies do you oh, observe? Oh, sorry, the... sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. Good. Yep. So um, <laughs> these are typically you're looking at this continuum emission. <clears throat> and so the synchrotron is formed in a continuum emission that we observe with the VLA, the very large array, the Jansky very large array um, in New Mexico. And we also can use the very large or very long baseline array, the VLBA, um, to look at that same continuum at even smaller scales. And that's um, an array of radio dishes from Hawaii to Florida. And so they're enor it's an enormous uh, interferometer. But it's uh, typically around like eight gigahertz, um, if we want a number there. So it's in the, the, the ones to tens of gigahertz. All right, sounds cool. <laughs> They're already asking when your second talk is going to be after the next round of observations. <laughs> um, <clears throat> are some galactic central areas more dense, they use the word clumpy, um, causing more fluctuations or more activity with time? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, so it would make sense logically, but the material is generally got to be fed in to the black hole somehow. So it's usually some sort of gas lane that's falling into that's being that's falling into the black hole for these active galactic nuclei. Uh, but I mean. That could be formed from a merger, or, I mean, maybe you have a, a, a ring of star formation, like a starburst ring that's going on, and that's creating a bunch of winds uh, off of the stars, and that, the, those winds are falling into the black hole in the center. Um, so typically, I mean, I don't know how they differ, how the environments differ necessarily 
from quiescent galaxies, galaxies without an active galaxy or an active nucleus in the center. So Frank showed the Whirlpool galaxy early on, this beautiful grand design structure with the dust lanes and stuff. I don't know why those dust lanes aren't falling into the supermassive black hole at the center. <laughs> like, uh, so, I mean, if, if you told me that that one was not an AGN and that another one was an AGN, I wouldn't be able to necessarily tell just by looking at them. So, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not really yeah. sure then. But, you know, the other thing is that the feeding time scale for a supermassive black hole is well beyond a human time scale. So, I mean, I guess there is sort of a record of the feeding uh, in the jet, right? As you said, it takes time for that jet to propagate or the, the, the energy to the propagate radiation, out. Yeah, the radiation right? the coming radiation from that central prop engine. Out. And so if it had an especially active time of feeding, then there would be an especially intense region oh, somewhere man. out. Yeah, and talk, could like, we, there's been some yeah, work on you, that. Could you deconvolve I, the energy history of the black right. hole from stuff? I, so it's really hard for me. So like, okay, if you had just a <laughs> very even plane of gas that it was, the flashlight was shining onto, and it was all just like the same media, like same density and stuff. If the, the flux intensity like changed over time, then, then you'd know like, yeah, this was an active, more active period where it was like flaring and then it was less yeah. active here. But the the surface that you're shining on is just so irregular too, that it's really hard, hard for me to try to like pull out where it was brighter and where it was fainter. But you're right, yeah, I mean, if you were able to do that, you could see how what the activity of the AGN was like over time. Like, oh, it was eating a bunch of stuff at this period, and this gas is a lot brighter than it should be next to it, than the gas next to it, right? Uh, the variations in the intensity of the flashlight of doom. That's right. Oh, that's like a, that's definitely a Indiana Jones. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Sorry. Is that, is that our uh, PhD thesis project, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking Mega Maid. Uh, All right. Um, so, uh, oh, the okay. AC who asked our one. previous. I got two. Two? Okay, two more. Okay, yep. Two more. Okay. Um, AC, the asker of our previous question, says, an, as an amateur radio astronomer, he observes the 21 centimeter natural hydrogen emission from our galaxy <laughs> at about 1420 megahertz. Right. So that is emission from a gas line. So that traces where the molecular or the, where the hydrogen gas is. And so as we were talking about with the difference between Hubble and with James Webb, looking at these different colors or the different frequencies are going to give us different dimensions of the, um, the structure that's going on there. So that, that 21 centimeter line is super helpful for like tracing uh, gas lanes. And I know that we, I, I remember writing a paper that we were able to say, oh, this AGN is active because it's eating, it's accreting material from its neighbor over there because we can trace the 21 centimeter emission from that galaxy to our galaxy. And so that, but that's a different, gotcha. yes, that, that while it, it is a radio emission line, it is telling us a different uh, bit of information that, we're, that we okay. use also to create the story of understanding what's happening each, in each of these galaxies. Yeah, it's, re it's really important to understand that these different emission lines come from different physical processes. Uh, you know, simple to understand that, um, you know, uh, temp gas at 3,000 degrees emits one emission line, gas at 10,000 degrees emits a different uh, emission line. Uh, same thing happens in the radio uh, in terms of the, the yeah. different radio emissions. And it doesn't have to be net different wave bands either. Like in the infrared with James Webb, you're looking at like warm molecular gas, which is like a couple hundred degrees Kelvin. And the, there's emission lines right next to it that is like quintuply ionized nitrogen or neon or something. <laughs> like, and it's right there next to it. So like, if you look at those two different lines, they're going to tell you completely different stories, even though they're almost the exact same wavelength. And, and, and as we emphasized, it's the underlying physics that you're getting a, a handle on from the, the various things that you were right. observing. Okay, you said you had one more, Grant? Yes, yes. We always get one snuck in really good question, and I'm going to end on this one. Okay. How have you found ways to keep astronomy real and grounded for you? I found it can become academic over time and kind of lose its magic. Um... <clears throat> So I always consider myself 
as I've alluded to a couple of times tonight, like I'm a detective, I'm a gumshoe, and like I'm using all of this data from different wave bands uh, to tell these stories. And I, I'm not a survey person. I don't look at hundreds or tens of galaxies usually at a time. I look at one really hard and with uh, like in the optical and the UV and the infrared. And I use that to um, uh, glean some new facet of how AGN work and how that really um, works with all of the rest of the AGN that we look at. Right now, I mean, this radio thing is just the worst because I'm very convinced <laughs> that this is what's happening um, in these radio quiet AGN. And so I'm spending a bunch of time trying to convince other people that this is the case. But I feel right now that I'm in the majority, I'm in the minority. So um, that is my, my quest right now is to have folks acknowledge that this is potentially what's going on and how useful it would be if that is the case. Um, because then we can see, like if we just do a radio survey of this continuum emission, we can see, uh, we can take a census of how many AGN are shocking or compressing the gas of their host galaxies for um, all the nearby galaxies. So then when people model how outflows work in AGN, they can say, well, we should have the outflows run into the host plane approximately 40% of the time because that Fisher guy found that the uh, extended radio structure happens about 40% of the time in these galaxies. So that would suggest that that's where positive feedback is happening. And we'll have to incorporate that into our models. So, so that's what's keeping me going right now. Um, and so that's going to keep happening until the money runs out or <laughs> something else is more attractive to me. But uh, that's how what I'm doing. That's a good that's way to think of it, though. Time. But oh, that's ahead, the fun Frank. thing about science is there's always another problem to solve. If you get bored with this problem, which, you know, this is a quite a fun problem, I, I, I must say. Uh, but there's always yet other problems to go, you know. So you can just say, okay, let's cut. That's the end of this season. Let's move on to the next season of, you know, Galactic Detective. That's right. I, I, like, I like the specific work, the, the word that you used is quest. Because it just yeah. makes me think that it's not like another project. It's not another thing you're discovering. It's a side quest. Like, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like, here's a data set. We're going to figure out why this data set is important and what it's illuminating for us. And then we, that's just part of the bigger picture. But, uh, and then right. there's always another quest on the horizon that you're like, you're finishing this one and you're like, what am I going to do after this? And then you're like, that one. I have to go work on that idea next. Yeah. That's All right. Well, we on. wish you the best of luck in your yes. continuing series of quests. Um, you and, you know, when you when you get the answers, come on back and, and let us know. Great. Next month, uh, April 4th, Exploring Rocky Worlds on the Precipice of a New Frontier. Catherine Bennett from the Space Telescope Science Institute. We will see you then. Thank you all for, for, for listening and have a great day. Bye, everybody.